Good morning, I'm Walt, and this is Delta Astrophotography. And this is a Celestron 11 inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, also known as the C11. Can this thing pull off some deep sky astrophotography, or should it just be left to planetary photography and visual observation? Join us and find out in today's episode of. I have no idea! <laughs> My C11 is not the Edge HD version, which is made for astrophotography and it's supposed to be flat across the entire field of view. It is an old school 2001 model that came on a Nexstar GPS 11. The classic C11 can be bought as the OTA or optical tube assembly, or basically just the telescope only, or you can get it on some kind of mount. Uh, very common is one of the Nexstar mounts. Like I said earlier, I had the very old Nexstar GPS 11. It was given to me by somebody who felt like they couldn't use it anymore and wanted to find somebody who would use it. So the next are GPS units, they could align themselves with GPS. The newer ones use something called StarSense where they can figure out where they are or Wi-Fi. There's all kinds of good ways to get that kind of Nexstar mount aligned. The mounts that come with the Celestron Nexstar series are called alt as or altitude azimuth mounts. And what that means is they move your telescope up, down, up, down, and left and right. And using those motions, they can access anything in the sky and track it all night. So why did I take my telescope out of this nice mount that seems to be able to do just about anything, including go to? Okay, I'm gonna to try to explain why alt as mounts are not very good for deep sky astrophotography with a little help of the intergalactic space mustard. So when a deep sky target rises, it's gonna rise in the east and it's going to move across the sky like this. And as you can see throughout the night, it's going to rotate. And by the end of the night, it's almost like upside down from what it was at the beginning of the night. Let's pretend this is our telescope on an alt as mount. All it can do is move up, down, left, and right. So when the space mustard is coming up, it can look over here and it's gonna tilt up and then follow it like this. The mustard is gonna to continue to rotate. This thing is just gonna follow it. And then when it goes down, it'll tilt down. So what's happening is this thing is staying straight like this. It never rotates, it's just staying straight. So as this thing, as our space mustard rotates in, in the sky, this thing doesn't make up for that. It just, so if I try to do a long exposure, it's gonna catch this thing rotating and create blur really fast. So we cannot do long exposures. And that's kind of the whole point of deep sky astro astrophotography. What we want is something that will rotate with this. And that's a German equatorial mount. And those look more like this. So let's say our space mustard is rising. We pointed at the space mustard over here on our German equatorial mount. As we can see, it's already tilted like this and it will just follow it and keep it exactly in frame. It'll follow the rotation exactly and we can do very long exposures. The telescope will rotate throughout the entire night just like that. I hope that was a very intelligent and adult way to explain the difference between an alt as and a German equatorial mount. And for you Europeans out there, I know this is crap American mustard, but that's all right. I've got a little Coleman's too for those of you in the UK. I like decent mustard sometimes. Oh God, oh God, oh God. So I've got the EQ6R Pro, that's a German equatorial mount, so I'm gonna throw it up on there. But before I did, you know, after I deforked my telescope and took it completely off that alt as mount, I had to buy some accessories. And even though the, uh, the entire telescope setup was a gift, it ended up not being cheap to do this. Let's check it out. So the very first thing I'm gonna need is a good dovetail. I don't wanna skimp on the thing that actually holds the telescope to the mount. So this is what I chose. This is a Los Mandy DC-11, uh, about 115 bucks. This thing is very solid and I like it a lot. The next very important item I needed is a corrector reducer. Now, like I said earlier, my telescope is not the Edge HD, so the stars aren't gonna be round all the way through the field of view. They're gonna have some coma, they're gonna be stretched out, and a corrector reducer fixes that. 
Not only do they correct the stars, but they reduce the focal ratio down from F10 to F6.3, so that lets in a lot more light. Also reduces the focal length from 2,800 millimeters to 1,690 millimeters, which actually makes things a lot simpler. This one right here is supposed to be one of the best on the market, but unfortunately, it costs almost as much as a star tracker and I can't afford that right now. Not only that, but it's been out of stock everywhere pretty much all year as far as I can tell. So instead, I just went with the regular Celestron version for 189 and so far it's worked for me just fine. It may not be edge HD quality, but you know what? I'm getting some images, so I don't care. Another very important item I needed was another counterweight. So all this stuff is pretty heavy and my Skywatcher EQ6R Pro just came with two and an extension rod. And you're not really supposed to use the extension rod if you can, you're, you wanna keep all your weight closer to the center. That being said, I do kind of use it just a little bit, but I needed a new counterweight and all the Skywatcher counterweights have been sold out, but I did manage to find one from Orion because Orion made the Orion Atlas mount, which is pretty much the same as the Skywatcher and it was just black, that's it. So. Here it is. Looks like they still have some in stock now for $62.89. And mine actually did cost me $73.99. But it is basically the same counterweight in black, which I think is sexy anyway. Next on the list of things I absolutely had to have was a dew heater strap. Because here in the Delta, no matter whether it's summer or winter, my telescope is gonna fog up after about 30 minutes. So I needed a good dew heater band. And ended up going with something like this right here. It's got the RCA plug, so I can plug it into my Pegasus Pocket Power Box Mini to power all my stuff. And so far it's worked pretty well. Oh, I forgot a very crucial piece of equipment I had to buy to make this telescope usable for astrophotography, and that's the new guider. My little mini guide scope is not nearly big enough to guide with this giant Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. So with large telescopes like this, you're supposed to use what's called an off-axis guider. Basically, it splits the light between your main camera and your guide camera. So essentially, your telescope is your guide scope. Does that make sense? Unfortunately, right now, an off-axis guider for my telescope is kind of like the Star Zona. It's like almost Star Tracker price. Of $339, I cannot afford that right now, especially since I have so much other stuff I need to be paying for. So what did I do? I just bought a bigger guide scope. I know that's adding more weight and it's not nearly as good as an off-axis guider, but I need to get rolling. Here's what I got. I ended up going with the SV Boney 60 millimeter guide scope for $86.99. A few more quick accessories I had to get, uh, a Batonoff mask. And Batonoff masks are really, really handy. They help you focus and they're cheap as hell. Check this one out. And I got this one for $22.16. And finally, I need a Canon adapter to attach my camera to the telescope. My telescope actually came with one, but it was kind of old. It was wearing out, the camera wouldn't connect in properly. So what I ended up doing is ordering one of these. And this, this worked just fine. So yeah, I skimped on a few things but that's because I had a lot to buy. So let's see how much everything actually cost. The Laws Mandy was $115. The corrector reducer was $189.95. Counterweight is $62.89. Betnoff mask, $22.16. Canon adapter, $16.95. Guide scope is $86.99. And the dew heater is $65.95. $560 worth of accessories and I got the cheap ones. I quit, I, I can't do it anymore. Sharon, will you take me back? I'm done with this astronomy shit. No, 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 I'm gonna get my job back at the leaf blower factory. In all seriousness, I saved up for a few months and bought each piece kind of when I could afford it. And that's what you should do too. Don't try to buy a bunch of astronomy equipment all at once. You're gonna get in some serious debt. This is the EQ6R Pro and it's the mount we're going to use with the telescope. It has a maximum weight capacity of 44 pounds or 20 kilograms, but it's recommended you only use half that at 22 pounds. The C11 telescope weighs 27 pounds. That's already over half the maximum payload capacity. So what actually happens if you get close to the maximum payload capacity? Does it break? What, what happens? I'm at 35 pounds if I can just get a little more on there. So you have chosen death. 
So what actually happens is the longer the focal length you have, the more the weight really matters. The C11 has a focal length of 2,800 millimeters, and with the reducer corrector, it has a focal length of, I think, 1,690 millimeters. That's large. And with all the accessories put on there, it weighs around 35 pounds. That's about close to 16 kilograms. That's really pushing it. And a three minute exposure is completely out of the question. Two minute exposures, I can get about half my exposures look okay. So if you wanted two hours of exposure time, you better go ahead and plan on shooting for four hours because you're gonna be throwing half your exposures away. I found the sweet spot for me is about one minute. Most of the exposures look okay. I do throw some away. And without an off axis guider, my stars still aren't quite perfect. They're a little egg shape. If I was to shoot with a 600 millimeter telescope and it was a little over 30 pounds, I might be able to get two or three minute exposures, but at 1,690 millimeters, that weight, the 35 pounds, is really pushing this mount. And this is a good solid mount. All right, now let's pretend I have all the wires on here and everything's hooked up like it's supposed to be. Let's balance the thing. Balancing's not that much different than any other uh, German equatorial rig. It's just when you're using stuff this big and this heavy, it takes a, just a little bit more effort and everything seems to have a huge impact, even the smallest things. So first thing you gotta remember is never balance with the cover on. That cover's heavy and I've balanced a few times and then started to image and wondered why my tracking and guiding was just really crap. And that's because, yeah, that thing ruined everything. All right, so as usual, when you balance, I'm gonna loosen my right ascension, let it fall. I'm gonna kind of hold on to everything. And I am a little telescope heavy. Just gonna slide the black weight out just a fraction of an inch. I hadn't even reached the end of the first uh, counterweight rod yet. This is the extension started about right here. So we're good to go. Probably didn't even need the extension rod. I'm gonna move the middle back just a touch. I mean, we're, we're good and balanced here. I don't need to do a whole lot more. Now I'm gonna balance my declination. Bring it back down again to the side here. Hello, loosen that declination. Well, it looks like I got it on the first try. That, that never happens. I promise you that never happens. But if I didn't, if it was falling forward like that, that means it's front heavy. And I would loosen the saddle and I'd pull the whole telescope back that way. But looks like I don't have to do that. I'm like perfectly balanced right now. I can point it in any direction. That's kind of fun to do. <laughs> Scary because it, the telescope's so big, but all right, we're good and balanced. So let's talk about what it's actually like shooting with this thing and let me give you some advice on how to do it. First, do yourself a favor and set all this up in the daytime and go ahead and focus on something far away in the distance. That's gonna help you so much in the long run because trying to find anything at either 2800 or with the reducer corrector uh, 1690 focal length. And finding anything with those big focal lengths is very difficult. So go ahead and just try to find something in the daytime and focus on that. Now once it's nighttime and you got everything set up, fired up and ready to roll, let's do this. You take your cover off. Hopefully you balanced with the cover off earlier in the day. Now go ahead and turn the tracking on your mount on and take a three to five second exposure just right there while it's in the home position. Use that test shot to test your focus, fine tune it, turn your focus or get those stars as small of a pinpoint as possible and just keep taking test exposures until you get them as small as you can. Now with this huge focal length, polar aligning just with the polar scope and using your eye, I don't think that's enough. You gotta get really, really accurate. So you might wanna get one of those electronic polar scopes that connects to your laptop, or use some polar alignment aid software in your laptop like SharpCap, or just use the ASI Air. This thing is amazing and it just does everything for you. So the ASI Air is mostly what I use, so I'll be talking about that the most. So we've got our test shots as in focus as we can get them for now. Let's go ahead and run the polar alignment feature on the ASI Air or however you're gonna do your polar alignment uh, using some kind of polar alignment aid. So when polar aligning, you gotta get your numbers down as small as possible. We're talking about sub arc seconds small. That's really important. Get your numbers small. I wish I could show you, but I haven't actually taken a, a screenshot of 
graph guiding numbers or anything like that. And it's gonna be cloudy and rainy for the next week. But just trust me, if you've ever tried to use a computer or an app to pull a line and you, you're trying to get those numbers as small as possible, get them like, you know, sub arc seconds. Now that you've got everything polar on, you can go ahead and slew to whatever bright stars out that night, Vega, Sirius, Antares, something like that. And this is just so we can fine tune our focus and I'm gonna use a Batnoff mask to do so. All right, it's Walt from editing. And one thing I forgot to mention that's very important is plate solving. Like I mentioned earlier, it's extremely difficult to find any target manually, especially with these big focal lengths. I actually spent about 15 minutes just trying to find the moon one night. So use plate solving and basically that's when your uh, so your software, either on your computer or the ASIR, looks at your test shot, then compares it to a star map and figures out where it is. And it'll help you go to and find objects faster. And then once you get the object in frame, it'll help center them faster. So yes, don't try to find this stuff yourself. Let your software find it for you plate solving, especially in the ASI air, which is already built in. Batten off masks with these telescopes are absolutely incredible. Once I get that on there, I can open up the live view on the back of my camera and see the diffraction spikes really well. If I zoom in a little bit, the diffraction spikes will take up the whole back of the camera screen and I can just easily adjust the focus in real time, get those diffraction points exactly where they need to be with the little X with a straight line through it. Focusing with this big of a telescope and a backing off mask is a dream. Now you can salute to your target, initiate your auto guiding and go for it. So how long can your exposures realistically be? Like I said earlier, with all this stuff on the telescope and the weight's probably close to 35 pounds, 16 kilograms, uh, not very long. Three minutes is not possible. I tried two minutes with the Cygnus wall. At ISO 600, I could get two minutes and start to see a little bit of detail, but I ended up having to throw half my images away. They were bad. And also I would go out every 30 minutes and check and sure enough, the stars had started to trail after 30 minutes. So I uh, set everything back to the home position, recheck my polar alignment, slew back to the target, recalibrate the auto guiding and start over. And it would look fine for another 30 minutes. Then I'd have to start the whole process over. It was kind of a nightmare to be honest. Also recently, I tried the Trifid Nebula, which is a very bright nebula, and only had to do one minute exposures before I was to see a lot of detail, and that worked out fine. You know, I, I wasn't throwing away nearly as many photographs. I might have had to go out maybe once throughout the imaging session, and I imaged it over two or three nights, actually. But uh, once each night, and just kind of check and see if things have gotten way off, and sometimes it would get way off for like a photograph or two and then it would correct itself. So I think one minute is a sweet spot with all the equipment on there. I would love to get an off axis guider and see if that makes a big difference. I've heard it definitely makes a difference in the shape of your stars, but I think it's gonna make a big difference on guiding as well. But I've also heard auto guiders are very difficult with DSLRs, so I might wait till I get a dedicated astronomy camera. If you use a big C11 on your EQ6R Pro, I'd like to know what's the maximum amount of exposure time you've really been able to pull off consistently. Let me know in the comments below. And I guess the most important thing is you probably wanna see how it actually performs, some proof, some photographs. So I guess I'll go ahead and show you that. And that'll be the end of this video. So I just wanna say a special thank you to all of you who watched and have been watching throughout the last year and a half or so. You've been so amazing. And if you're new, please uh, give this channel a subscribe. Uh, I can't say that I post videos every week, but I post them when I can get around to them. And they're usually a good time. If you like this video, give me a like, it really helps out the channel. And well, I guess that's all there is to it, everybody. As always, stay spacey and good night. <laughs>